Should we open in a word of prayer? We ask the Lord's blessing. Our God and Father, we thank you again for every blessing we have received as we go along this pathway. We thank thee for the best gift of all, thy Son, our blessed Lord Jesus. When we think that we were strangers, rebels even, we um, wanted far from thy fold. And yet how in love and in grace thou wouldst reach out to man. And we thank thee for thy wondrous grace. We've been singing this afternoon unfathomable. No heart can really fathom such love and such grace as this. And so today as we would again would sit around thy word we pray that the spirit of god would minister to each one that will nurse their needs uh, individually and also collectively and we pray that at the end of it all we each would be able to say individually lord it was good for me to be here we pray that thou would speak to each of our hearts by thy word and by thy spirit this afternoon and help us to Get a fresh glimpse of our blessed Lord Jesus, who now is in the glory. And may we bless his uh, wondrous name as we give thanks. We do so in his worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> now, uh, our topic is return and recovery. And yesterday we were looking at return, first of all, for a sinner who does not know the Lord Jesus as Savior. We looked at a prodigal son, one who returned and received a welcome, a welcome that was unexpected, as it were. When we think of the insult and the injury that he brought to the father, and yet how the father would receive him. And in the words of the servant, thy father had received him safe and sound. Now the elder brother could not understand such grace. He questioned the father's love and the father's action. He couldn't rejoice with the father because he never really understood grace. As a matter of fact, he thought that he was owed something. He said, I've been slaving as it were all these years and you've never really given me anything as if I earned it. I have a right. I should have been given but he never really understood the father's heart the father's grace what brought pleasure to the heart of the father and we wanted to say that in the same way God uh, receives sinners if there's anyone here today who don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior doesn't matter how far you have wandered doesn't matter how far away you are from God, whatever the, your sins are, uh, he would receive you. And he has sent his son, we had that this morning, a blessed Lord Jesus, so that you might come and be blessed. And then we looked at the uh, life of Nehomi and her husband Elimelech as believers who had a profession and how God holds us responsible and accountable for the profession that we make. And they lived in a day when there was lawlessness, every man doing what was right in his own eyes. There was no king uh, that characterized that day. No restraint, no submission. Um, everyone doing what was right in his own eyes. We read of idolatry and gross sin, uh, going on but this man his name means whose God is king my God is king and in that day when there was no king and everyone did what 
he wanted to win his own will, there was one man at least who was saying, my God is king. I bow, as it were, for us as believers, we bow to the lordship of Christ. We profess his lordship. And in our actions, um, we need to demonstrate that. And Elimelech was put to the test that God was really his king. He could trust God in spite of the famine, in spite of the difficulties. And we read that he sought out a path, self-will, acted, as it were, doing his own thing, seeking a path on his own, by himself, like the others were doing. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. And I think the challenge for us, brethren, those of us who are believers, is that we might live in the good of the profession that we make. And we are going to be challenged, we are going to be tested in these same profession. In the assembly, if we bow to the Lordship of Christ, that's where the test is going to be. That when we act, that whatever we do or say, we show that we bow to his Lordship. And so we have, in Elimelech, we have a warning that if there is departure, if there is a backslidden state, and it's not judged, it's not dealt with, then the Lord will come in in judgment. And so there was no recovery, we read, for in Elimelech's case. But his wife, she was also individually responsible. And we find that she heard, and she responded. She was responsive to the message, and she went back. She was old, she um, had lost everything, so to speak, lost her testimony. She said, even if I had hope, lost her hope. But she came back um, to the place where God would have her to be, and we read how God would bless that, um, that action that she did. And she came back to blessings. We read of um, a reserved portion, as it were, for her. How she could be blessed in uh, being of help to others. Um, and then in the end, we have how uh, um, um, she had uh, Ruth gave birth to a son. And she took the child and put it in her bosom, and she became nurse onto the child. What a wonderful um, example of revival and restoration and recovery. What a hope, you might say, she had when she put that child on her bosom. And then the end of that um, section, we alluded to the fact that God would often bring us back to a blessing and a portion that maybe is even higher than what we have left before. Now, when we come back, there is a cost, and we have this in Ruth and in Naomi, that there was a cost. Just ask, is this the homie? And she said that the Lord had dealt with her. I went out full, but that the Lord brought me home again empty. And for us, no matter what the condition is, no matter how we have lost everything, maybe some might be thinking it's too old now for me, but there is hope. And as I was saying at the end of this book, of Ruth, you know it says that um, it gives a little um, genealogy there. Uh, it says the women, her neighbors, gave him a name, saying, there is born a son to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, 
the father of David. What a wonderful, uh, you might say, um, blessing. What a wonderful way that God rewarded her. You turn over to Matthew, and you find that Ruth's name is in connection with the birth of our blessed Lord Jesus. What a thing. You might say what she left, she went seeking a rest, and she went seeking, um, you might say, betterment. But she came back, and when she returned, what a blessing. And so there once there is blessing in return. Now, today we uh, want to look in the New Testament, and again, I'm having problems with the um, overhead, but we want to look at restoration in the life of a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And I want us to look at Peter. And before we talk about Peter's failure, how Peter failed, denied the Lord, and how um, he was restored, I want us maybe for a few minutes, very quickly, to just kind of trace the life of Peter a little bit. And we have um, many, many, many references to this disciple, this man, Peter. And I think what a wonderful testimony. Oftentimes we focus on the negative part. But it's such a wonderful testimony of this disciple uh, of the Lord. And so if you go through at the beginning, and I'm going to mention the references very quickly. We can have them at the end later. In the book of John, John chapter 1 and verse 40 and so on, we have that one of the disciples who uh, followed Jesus. Remember when John had uh, pointed out, behold the Lamb of God, the two disciples left following John and follow Jesus. And one of those two disciples was Simon. I mean, it was Andrew, Simon's brother. And it says, he went and findeth his brother Simon, John 1, verse 41, and brings him to Jesus. He said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is being the interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Andrew, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And so we have his conversion. It's wonderful to see for all of us as believers, there's a time where we came to know the Lord Jesus and there is what we can call conversion. Hmm. But then later on in Luke's gospel, we have this account of how the Lord Jesus um, went into a ship, which was Simon Peter's, Luke chapter 5, for those of us who are looking it up. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. The Lord Jesus, that he went into a ship, and he taught the people, and then after he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, it was Simon's ship, he says, cast the net over on the right side. And Peter says, uh, verse 5, Peter answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And we read there was such a great um, catch that night. But what I wanted to underline is this. It says, and um, he was astonished, verse, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Now, he had said first, Master, but now he says, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so, um, verse 11, it says, And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed Jesus. What a thing. I just want to mention quickly. Oftentimes it's when we have lost all. 
when we have no other resources, then we uh, <coughs> seek the Lord, we try to we follow him. But with this man, Peter, this was when things were going well. This is when business really took off. They had such a drought of fish. They never had the catch like this before. And then it comes to land. And he leaves all and follows Jesus. That's consecration, isn't it? That's dedication. Many of us, we would now we want to settle down and now we want to enjoy. And now, we, but he leaves all. And he follows Jesus. We have many times Peter's confession. It is, speaks about when Jesus came over to Caesarea Philippi. He said to the disciples, whom do men say that I the son of man am? And some say John the Baptist and so on. And then Lord Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art, and the Lord Jesus says, you know, Simon, Barjona, flesh and blood had not given this to you. But my father, he had a direct revelation from God. I wanted to think of the the wonderful experiences the scriptures would bring us of this, this man, Peter. We have also in John chapter 6, it says that many of the disciples from that time, they went back and walked no more with the Lord Jesus. Then Jesus turned and says to the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Peter answered. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What conviction, what certainty. You know, it's so good to look, to trace the life of this, this man, Peter. And I was thinking as a believer, aren't these the things that, you know, really would make our life, as it were, so full of, 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 of zeal, so full of certainty and conviction, as it were. And um, when we had that night, we, did, we always speak of the time when uh, he, he, he sank in the water. But remember, it said it was a dark night. And it was a stormy night. And I was thinking that Peter and the others, some of the others, were fishermen. They were accustomed to the sea. And we read that they were afraid. It must have been a storm to make them afraid. These seasoned fishermen. And in the dark and in the storm, they saw the Lord coming. And the Lord says to them, Fair enough. Be not afraid to die. And Peter speaks up. And I said, you know, he's, he's the one to speak up. And he says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. And I was thinking, what faith? Because at least he wasn't in the ship. And to step out into the storm, it was not uh, this, still yet. It was still raging. It was still stormy. It was still dark. And Peter stepped out to go to the Lord. I think in John 17 of that mountaintop experience where the Lord would take a few of his disciples, Peter being one, take them up to this mountaintop and he was transfigured before them. And Peter saw it. But Peter speaks up again. He says, Lord, uh, if thou wilt, I will make three, will make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And God the Father <coughs> intervenes, as it were. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
hear ye him. What an experience. And then we have in Mark 14, I want to call this sincerity, and I want to call this devotion. That Jesus said unto them, All of you shall be offended because of me this night. And then Peter speaks up again, verse 29. But Peter said unto him, Although all should be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spoke, and vehemently he says, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. I think he was sincere. We have him in John 13, where he says, where the Lord Jesus would wash the disciples' feet. Dost thou wash my feet, he says. Thou shalt never wash my feet. Zeal. In Luke chapter 22, we read that verse 49 when they were, um, when they saw, that was those disciples who were about the Lord Jesus, when they saw what would befall him. We have in verse 50, one of them, and we know it was Peter, he smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his head. He was going to try to defend the Lord. And I was thinking that the scripture gives us this disciple who exhibited devotion and zeal, very sincere. But also we have in that list of things, Peter's fall and Peter's failure. And you know, the thing that I question my own heart. Is why would the scripture bring before us. The failure and the faults. Of this you might say. So devoted, so sincere. A disciple. As we go through that list. There are the things that we would like to check off. In our own lives, would we not? To be sincere and to be zealous for the Lord. To, um, to have conviction and certainty and to be able to testify of the deity of the Lord Jesus with such conviction and assurance. And all of these things we can check off. And I was thinking oftentimes, you know, sometimes we have in our lives too, we have little checklists. And we think that, you know, well, I'm okay in this area. Check. How about devotion, you know? Check. How about faithfulness and going to the meetings and, and check and seeking to serve the Lord and we sometimes check and check. And we think that we're all right. We think that maybe in this area I'm okay and uh, I have this ability or I have this gift or I have this zeal and I'm going to really use it for the Lord and I'm doing the Lord's will and I'm doing the Lord's work. And this whole subject of departure and return maybe doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. 
So the Spirit of God brings before us one of the most devoted disciples. And shows us how he failed miserably. We all know how Peter denied the Lord Jesus. Was it for lack of sincerity? Was it for lack of devotedness or zeal? And how the Lord would restore him. And so there once none of us can say that we are above, that we don't fail, that um, there is not that which in our lives that the Lord would want to adjust. And so we want to look briefly at Peter's fall. And the first thing I want us to look at is self-confidence. And so in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22 and verse 33. We have here that Peter said, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and into death. Now, if we look at verse 31, the Lord Jesus speaks to Peter. It says, the Lord says, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when thou art turned back, strengthen thy brethren. Now Peter would respond. I wonder there once if the Lord were to speak to you or to me. To have her attention and to say, you know, I have something to say to you. <clears throat> and the Lord says, Satan desired to sift you. But I have prayed for you. Now there's a plural and singular day which we're not going to get into. But the Lord said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And Peter says, I'm ready to go to prison and to death. In other words, no need. Not necessary. What would be my response if the Lord says, I have prayed for you. It's like, for Lord, you know how helpless. And Peter said, no need. I am ready to go to prison. If that's what it takes, I'm ready to die for you. I want to say there once, this was self-confidence. It's strange that, you know, the Spirit of God would, as it were, bring us through the whole scriptures. We have all of these things, these wonderful things in the life of Peter. And we come to the end, as it were. And then the Lord is going to touch on these very things. This self-confidence. This impulsiveness. This zeal. Not rightly placed sometimes. self-confidence. I have prayed for thee. <clears throat> Peter's fall 
impulsiveness. Acting outside of the will of the Lord. If we turn to John 18, verse 10, we read that Simon Peter, having a sword, he drew it and smote off the high priest's servant heir, servant, um, the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said unto Peter, Put thy sword away, so to speak. The Lord said, Put away the sword. The cup which my father had given me, we had that this morning, shall I not drink it? There once there is zeal we might say. If we go back to, I think, the portion in Luke chapter 22, there they ask, Lord, shall we smite? But Peter never waited for the Lord to respond. Because if he had waited for the Lord to respond, the Lord would have told him not to. He acted outside of the will of God. Because the Lord says, the cup which the Father gave me, shall I not? Are you going to try to stop this? Sometimes there was, my point is this, that we might very zealously think we are acting for the Lord and doing something for the Lord. But if we do so outside of the mind of the Lord, outside of his will, that zeal, that, that impulsiveness, that desire that we have has to be, as it were, is, is being guided by Him. Has to be according to His Word. Has to be according to the mind of the Father. It was not the Father's will to defend the Lord Jesus, to try to um, fight off the, the guards and the high, I mean, the high priest servants and those who were there. The cup which the Father gave me, shall I not drink it? The Lord Jesus could have defended himself. He says, I could ask my Father, and he would send legions of angels. When they asked, who seek he? The Lord says, I'm he. They fell backwards. But he, he yielded himself. We read that he submitted himself to the will of God the Father. He did not resist. Peter was going to resist the best way he knew. But he did not call for resistance then. And the Lord was showing him a better way. Impulsiveness. We have also in Luke chapter 22 that he followed verse 54. But that he followed afar off. And there was sometimes I wonder if there's one here this afternoon who maybe is following but is following afar off. We read of Peter sleeping when the Lord was praying. And the Lord says, can he not watch? So there once, these are things that we find um, that led, as it were, downward in terms of Peter's failure, Peter's fall. When we see him at the arrest of the Lord Jesus, we have him again in Luke chapter 22. There were those who were warming themselves. Soldiers made a fire. Luke chapter 22 verse 54. He sat with them. And he warmed himself. In the wrong place. We said yesterday. False position. He sat among them. Verse 52. 
sorry, verse 55. He warmed himself with them. Verse 56. And then we have the denial. Luke chapter 22 again. I would read quickly from verse 54 for connection. They took Jesus and led him away and brought him unto the high priest's house and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the court and were seated together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked at him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, And he, and he denied, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another one saw him. And said, Behold, thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And after about the space of an hour, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, thou this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Sometimes the things that we pride ourselves in Sometimes the things that we we feel we okay. The things that we sometimes want others to recognize of us. His dedication, he's very dedicated. His zeal, he's very zealous. You know, who could question Peter's love and, and Peter's sincerity? And that's what I wanted us to look at before. Really, when we look at this man, Peter, and we look at his life as he goes with the Lord Jesus, I'm sure there was none of those disciples who really questioned his sincerity, his love, and the fervor he had for the Lord. And yet, he's allowed to fail. That's a word. But there once there is restoration and there is recovery. And if we see in the life of this dear disciple, this honored servant of the Lord who has failed. And, and sometimes it is the most gifted. It is the ones who, as it were, um, is the most used in Swan, who, who sometimes are, are not using that gift or that ability as the Lord would lead. And it becomes the things that trip them up. Sometimes it's our knowledge of the, the scriptures 
And the enemy will seek to use that to trip us up. Peter's restoration. I want us to notice seven things in Peter's restoration. And how at the end of the life of this man, how God would use him, the Lord Jesus could use him mightily. And the thing I notice as we go up, as we go along, as we we trace the life of, of Peter, is how the Spirit of God, as it were, would put things next to each other. We have the case where he stepped out into the sea, into the um, roaring sea, as it were, the stormy sea. And as I was mentioning before, it shows faith. He responded to the voice of the Lord Jesus. But we read also that he began to sing. Took his eyes off the Lord Jesus. And he began to sing. And you know in my Bible there is a little note at the top. It tells you what each section is about. And it says of Peter, Peter's little faith. And I was thinking, great faith to step out into the ocean. But you know the Lord Jesus says, O thou of little faith, why didst thou doubt? You know, I think the other disciples must have said, he has courage to step out in this dark, you know, stormy night. And everybody's afraid because the Lord says to him, Bid me come to thee. He stepped out. In Matthew 16, when Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we read the Lord Jesus says to him, Simon Barjona. Let me just turn to it quickly so that I don't miss go. Matthew 16. And Jesus said, verse 17, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt uh, loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And then we have the next section. And from that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Peter speaks up. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, a few verses before, there's a direct revelation from the Father. Flesh and blood and not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter began to rebuke him. Uh, verse 22. Saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. But the Lord Jesus turned and says unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those of men. And so it seems the Spirit of God would put these things 
one hand, we see this uh, wonderful disciple, this wonderful things. Let me check. Check. And then on the other hand, we find how, again, the same person, on the one hand, could be used to bring out wonderful truth. And then on the other hand, it can be failure. And there wants none of us we are about these things. And so we find that the Lord prays for Peter in terms of his restoration. And we had that before in Luke chapter 22. How the Lord Jesus says that Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desire to sift you as we. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith failed not. The Lord makes intercession. The Lord Jesus knew even before Peter fell. The Lord was praying for him. The Lord said, I prayed for you. And in terms of restoration, we said, dear ones, it always begins with the Lord. From the Lord's side. We said yesterday that no matter how far one wandered, it was the goodness of God that leads to repentance. The prodigal son, it was when he thought of the father's house and he thought of the grace of the father. It's what attracted him and brings him back. And so we have that the Lord prayed for Peter. In Luke chapter 22, verse 34, there is a warning. The Lord, as it were, warned Peter. He says, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt deny, uh, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. The Lord prayed for him. The Lord warned him. There when sometimes the Lord sends us a word of warning. Sometimes we feel we're okay. We have self-confidence. We can handle this. The Lord sends us a word of warning. Satan has its purpose. His purpose. The same things that we feel that, you know, I can tap myself on my back because I'm using this for the Lord. I'm doing this for the Satan wants to trip me up in that same thing, in that same area. Yeah. There when sometimes it's the area of our strength that the enemy is not at rest. He wants to tri trip us up. Lord said, all the disciples, Satan wants to sift you as we. But I prayed for thee. And the Lord gave him a warning. So that's the second thing. There is a warning. Now also in Luke chapter 22 we read that after Peter had denied three times, it was fair. He was afraid of what would happen. He had said before, he said, I will go to prison. I will die for you. I will not deny you in any wise. And then he was put to test. And you know, it seems like a little maid girl comes out. And this confident, self-confident man. A little maid girl comes with a little pointy finger and says, you're one of them. And that's all it took. Self-confidence went through the window. All the boasts, he says, although all shall deny you, all shall turn, never will I. I will not be offended. All it took was a maid girl. We have in Luke chapter 22 that the Lord turned 
and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. All it took was a look from the Lord. You know, I asked myself what kind of a look it was. There was Peter who was denying that he knew the Lord Jesus. And I thought that look of this gospel would have been in place to say, you ought to have been ashamed, Peter. But I don't think the Lord looked at him with a look of disgust and disappointment. A look of disdain, maybe. No. The Lord turned and looked at him. You don't know me, Peter? But I know you. <coughs> you deny me, Peter? I'm not going to deny you. You know, yesterday we had in Jeremiah how, as it were, they had forgotten the Lord. Look, I have not forgotten you. Peter, you say you don't know me? The Lord doesn't change their ones. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. I think it was a look that reached down into his heart. When their eyes met, it spoke volume to Peter's heart. I think there must have been many others in that room. There must have been other um, uh, 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 guards and many others. They didn't... It meant nothing to them. There was no response as a word. It meant nothing. All they saw is that it the Lord turned and looked at him. And that was enough. We read, he went out and wept bitterly. Also in that verse, there is the memory. The Lord looked and he remembered. There once the Lord used different things to bring us, as it were, to the point where we would turn around. The cock crew. People might think it was just a normal event. It happens every day. But on this occasion, it was a message to Peter. He remembered what the Lord had said. He went out and he wept. Sometimes I wonder what it was for Peter when he saw his Lord crucified and laid in a tomb, knowing that, you know, the last time that we met, they had been together for three and a half years, maybe. So many experiences, wonderful experiences. And now it's at the end. And Peter leaves. And how does he leave? 
one who has denied his Lord. We have Judas on the other side. Let me know about Judas. We will get it to Judas. I wonder what it was for Peter those days when the Lord was in the tomb. I wonder what went through his heart, what went through his mind. If only I could do it again. If only I had another opportunity, I had another chance. He denied his Lord. But the Lord had not given up on him. And that's my message. That the Lord reaches out to us in spite of our failure, in spite of our uh, uh, departure, in spite of our going away from him. He does not give up on us. There ones, if you're here this afternoon, who somehow have drifted from the Lord, he is not giving up on you. Don't think that you're too far gone. Don't think that now it's too late for me. Don't think that there is no hope. The Lord is not giving up. He has not given up on Peter. And he wants that Peter to know that. Now in terms of Peter restoration we said. The Lord sends a message. Now in Mark 16 verse 7. The Lord uses a message. Now it is the day of his resurrection. So the Lord Jesus had been in the tomb, and now it is the day of his resurrection. And we read in verse 7 that the, um, the angel, uh, we can read from verse 5, and entering into the sepulchre they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in white garment. And they were amazed. And he said unto them, Be not amazed. Ye see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where he lay. But go your way, and tell his disciples that he goeth before them in Galilee. Is that what we read? No. There is the and of Peter there. I think this was a very touching message for Peter. I think it was full of meaning. We have a message. It says to go tell his disciples. Peter must have felt, I am not in that group anymore. Not after I denied him the way I did. Go tell his sister and Peter. Why does this? And Peter. I think this was a message to help to bring about his restoration. Turn over to Luke chapter 24. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus. And we would have liked to talk about them, but we don't have the time. And here also where there were two who had left. And how the Lord would go out and seek to bring them back. So that they might, they might be back into the fold. But in Luke chapter 24. Look at verse 34. Now in verse 33 we read, we read, They arose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and appeared 
to feed them. What do you think? The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared unto Simon. The Lord Jesus was reaching out, as it were. I think this was a private meeting between the Lord and, and Peter to bring about restoration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, very quickly. First Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, we can read from verse, uh, verse 3 for connection. For I live unto you, first of all, that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture, and that he was seen of Cephas, Peter, and the twelve. It could have just said he was seen of the disciples. But the Spirit of God said he was seen of Cephas. And the twelve. There once these were steps, as it were. These were things the Lord did to bring about Peter's full restoration. For the time that is left, I want us to turn over to John chapter 21. In John chapter 21 we read, um, that we can read from verse 3, Simon Peter said unto them, I go fishing. And they said unto him, we go with thee. Now remember the Lord has said, from this time forward, henceforth, you shall no more catch fish but you shall be fishers of men. Now, Peter said, I go fishing. And they said, well, we go along with you too. Um, but when the morning, sorry, and verse 3, they went forth and entered into a boat immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew him not, knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have you any food? We said yesterday that there is no gain, no profit in the archer, as it were. Did you catch anything? Do you have any food? You went searching for food. They could have trusted the Lord. Now I figured they must have said, now we're going to have to make things out for ourselves. The Lord provided for them while he was with them all the time. Now, what would happen? Maybe I better get back fishing. What I know. Can I really depend on the Lord now? So they went fishing. Morning comes. Now this uh, fruitless night. A fruitless night of labor. They caught nothing all night. They're cold and hungry and it was fruitless they come and the Lord Jesus stands on the shore and he says have you any did it profit you any as it were have you any food and they have to answer no 
And so what we find that they come and on the shore, um, then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It's the Lord. And then again, Peter, it said. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he girded his fishers coats about him, and he, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. And the other disciple came in a little boat, but he couldn't wait. I want to say Peter was restored. Because if Peter was not restored, as it were, fully, he would not, as it were, be so um, in a haste to be at the feet of the Lord Jesus. So he rushes, as it were, cast himself into the sea to get to the Lord. And we read he gets there, and, um, and as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire, verse 9, of coals there, and fish laid and bread. They went seeking food, and really there was no need. The Lord had everything prepared for them. He knew their need. He knew they were cold. They were hungry. He knew it was a fruitless toil um, some night. And so they come to land, and there's bread, and there's fish, and there's a coal of fire. And you know, um, and then we, we read uh, verse 12. Jesus said unto them, come and dine. Everything prepared. And then we read, um, and none of them dared, uh, and none of the disciples dared ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And verse 13 Jesus then cometh and taketh bread. And gave to them and fish likewise. <coughs> what I want to mention there once, it would have been great grace and wonderful care for the Lord to have made the preparation for them and said to them, Come and help yourselves. But the Lord takes the bread and the fish and he serves them. Could they trust him? Could they put their confidence in him? And now we just want to take a few minutes in. And so, verse 15, So when they had done, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? There was something else the Lord needed to do for Peter. The root of that self-confidence, the flesh was still there. And the Lord in this public way was going to deal with it. And use it in such a way that Peter can be useful. To be a blessing for many. And that's my point there once. That the Lord has the whole company in mind. And what he does for this one is for the benefit as it were of all. We hear him saying before, when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. When we have restoration, when the Lord deals with us, it is so that others might benefit, it is so that the whole company might be in the good of it. 
And so the Lord says to Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? Remember who they said, All would forsake you, not I. And now Peter answers. He says, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I'm attached to you. You know that I love you. I think Peter all along maybe was trying to show or to demonstrate that, you know, he really loved the Lord. There was no question. Maybe in the disciples, the others mind as if Peter really loved the Lord. But here at this occasion, after he had denied the Lord, after what had transpired, I don't think he was too hasty. And the Lord says, Lovest thou me? The Lord knew his heart. I think Peter was questioning in his <clears throat> Have I demonstrated? He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said, feed my sheep. The Lord had touched the root cause, the self-confidence. When we see Peter here, it's not that self-confidence. Peter was kind of questioning his, his own self, as it were. The Lord said to him three times, now, remember the night before when the Lord said to him, you're going to deny me? He says, I wouldn't. The Lord said, I prayed for thee. It was like, you didn't need to. Because I really, you know, I'm, I'll lay down my life if I have to. And I mean it. Now the Lord says to him, do you really love me? And we can look at the, the words, the different words used for love and so on. But Peter says, I'm attached to you. The third time the Lord said, are you really attached to me? Touch the root. He now wasn't even sure of himself. But you know, if you see what the Lord does in each case, it says, feed my lambs. Why would the Lord commit his lambs, his sheep, to one who is not worthy, as it were, who, who is a failure. The Lord will show his confidence. When Peter had lost confidence in himself, the Lord will show, I have confidence in you. My most precious gift, Peter, I'm going to put them in your hands, in your care. What is it that is so precious to the Lord, the little lambs, the sheep? Those for whom he died. He's saying, Peter, you take care of them. I'm not worthy. I haven't measured up. When that little maid girl pointed her finger a couple of days ago, I denied you. I'm not capable. I'm not able. There was our strength is in him. It is he that keeps us from falling. And he will present us faultless. It's not what we can do. It's not our own abilities, our strengths. It's not a thing that we bandage about, you know, other, you know, I'm dedicated, I'm faithful, I pray more than everybody else, I read the scriptures more. It's not that. The Lord says to him, follow now me. The 
if it goes through, follow thou me. Now, I just want to mention two things and then I'll finish. In Acts chapter 3, In Acts chapter 3, we have in verse 12, that was a layman who was made whole. When Peter saw it, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12, he answered the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? But why look ye earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied. Who are you to talk about denial? Not a man lift a finger, not a man lift a tongue. Peter said, Whom ye delivered up. And denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you have denied the holy and the just. Here is a man who is restored. He could point a finger at them and he could say, You have denied the law. Whom you have crucified and have denied. Nobody says, Peter, who you to speak. In 1 Peter, I think Peter learned this lesson, this wonderful lesson. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his death. Who did not did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was revived, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self for our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are here. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your son. Can the Lord Jesus use Peter in a wonderful way, ministry to help, to build up the saints? There once, as we've mentioned before, if there is failure, maybe the most used, the most devoted, can, like Peter, fall. But that does not mean there's no hope. The Lord wants to restore and to bring you in a place where he can be of service and blessing, where he could really use. He wants to deal with the flesh in us. The flesh is in all of us.